Right now it is time for This Week in the Lakeville Journal. Uh, we've got Cynthia Hosswinder online. Cynthia, good morning. Good morning. And do we have Janet Manko online? Certainly. Good morning. <laughs> good morning. You know, it was so nice to uh, look at the paper when I got it last night and see the fireworks from Lime Rock Park and saw your pictures, uh, Janet, that you posted on Facebook of the fireworks uh, uh, and your headline with the picture, At Last Fireworks. Right. You know, uh, a year off and, boy, two <laughs> Two days of delays, really, you know, from when we hoped they would be this year. But, boy, uh, Monday was beautiful and a perfect night for fireworks, and lots of people came out. And it was really fun to be inside the park and see so many families there um, really excited. And you can see the picture of a little girl on her dad's shoulders uh, just excited as anything to be there. And um, it was it was fantastic. It really was. So that's uh, just a little bit of good news to open up the, uh, the open up the day. How about uh, the story that Patrick Sullivan? I've been saying this all along. Despite COVID nineteen, quote, they managed to persevere, and that is so true about not only Region One but all the school districts. Well, it's really about all of life, and yeah. the fireworks story is just another example of that. And graduations were very similar, where there was rain and then there wasn't rain, and the, the weather's so crazy and. Everybody has really had to learn to adapt to this roller coaster of um, unexpected things. And good things do seem to come out of it, which is, you know, hard for a control freak like me to, <laughs> to accept. And as my birthday comes up, I realize, like, this is the decade that I'm moving into where I have to learn to be a little more relaxed and, and expect the best because that's what we've been getting. And the Region 1 students, Region 1 Superintendent Lisa Carter gave a, a great report saying, you know what, these kids have learned so many life lessons and just stuck with it. It would have been so easy for so many kids to just say, like, I don't like school anyway, I'm not doing it. And they stuck with it and did great. Yeah, it's, just a, it's just a great story, and it's, a, it's great to look back and, and, and see exactly uh, how well everything really went when it could have gone off the rails uh, several times and it didn't. So uh, it just, it's, it's just nice to sit here and then to re-acknowledge all that. Interesting story by Patrick Sullivan that uh, we, we covered, uh, but you've got much, much more of it here in the paper, and that is the cell tower application, uh, which is uh, for the Wake Robin Inn property. And there really was only a few comments uh, that, that were addressed locally. There are two cell towers that are in play right yep. now. One is in Kent, and there's this one in Lakeville on the property of the Wake Robin, which is a fairly isolated property, but... The concern is that you would be able to see the tower from the lakefront properties along Lake the Lake. Very strong lake association. They're very protective of their properties there. Um, but, you know, it's one of those funny things where in the modern world with all these people moving up from New York, one of the first things they ask real estate agents is they want to be sure there's cell phone service there and that they can get Internet. So will it reduce their property values if cell phone service continues to be very spotty along the lake as it has been? Or will it be worse for property values if you can see a little bit of a tower over the trees? So we expected a little bit more pushback. We were a little surprised that we didn't see it. Dan and Kent, very strong pushback against the cell tower that's already been approved by the State Siting Council, and there is a lawsuit that's been going on since January about that. You know, as you said, because, I, you know, when they did that balloon test, I rode around the lake, and you can see, I mean, very. you really have to squint. You see very, very little of the tower. I think that's why once they did that balloon test, uh, there wasn't as much furor over it as could be. Uh, and, uh, and we'll have to see. if I mean, if it goes online, it'll give Salisbury and Lakeville some decent coverage finally because you'll have that. You have the uh, the world's smallest cell tower in the middle of Salisbury. But then you've got Salisbury School, uh, which uh, has a tower that's going to go online. So uh, Salisbury will come back and, and actually get into the the 21st century when it comes to to, to, to cell phone usage. Uh, and it's interesting. It's not a one. It's the opposite of a one percent issue where the people that are in some of the most valuable properties in town are the ones that have the worst cell phone service. Okay. All right. We'll move along uh, to the uh, other side of the uh, page, and that is uh, a, a change in the leadership of the Council of uh, of, of Governments. So the Council of Governments been getting a lot of. Um, a lot of static from uh, the town of Cornwall right now. It's not really clear to me whether they're objecting to the concept of the COG per se 
or whether they're objecting to one particular administrator within the COG, who's fairly new, fairly young, but has been going around from town to town and sort of advising on planning issues. Um, she's a young woman. She's local. And it does seem like when there are concerns that they, that they center around work that she's doing to help towns with their town plan of conservation and development and with bringing their regulations up to the state standard. And the concern seems to be we don't really necessarily feel that the state standard suits our particular town. Cornwall especially has concerns about home working regulations, and this seems to have been what sparked off all this uh, conversation about it. A lot of it's coming from a, name, a woman named Joanne Wojtuziak, who's a Cornwall resident, who, to her credit, is always at town meetings and really is paying attention to what's going on. And so she's kind of raising alarm bells, writing letters to the paper, and just saying, are we really, you know, are we okay with this? I mean, always good to ask. All right. Uh, and a couple of, uh, a couple of uh, uh, stories by Patrick Sullivan. We'll go, first of all, uh, to one of the talks, How Technology Can Fight the Many uh, Coming Pandemics. Right. It was a social reform talk with a, a young woman named Catherine. I think her name is Freya. Freya. And um, she's an expert on uh, gene editing, which is, one, like I guess the mRNA is a form of, of gene editing used to create ways to protect humans against these viruses. All of it, I think, comes back to climate change. It seems like all of the things that we're seeing right now, including I don't know if you were driving around and you saw this incredible amount of moths flying around yeah. in the last couple of days. The gypsy moths. <laughs> those are the gypsy moths. And so they were the caterpillars that destroyed our trees. Now all those caterpillars have turned into moths, and for the next six days they'll be laying eggs. So you want to keep an eye on your trees. But, like, I'm not going to condone any non-Buddhist activity, but if you go out, maybe take a butterfly net with you because these are going to be, you know, if we have an unusually high amount of moths laying eggs this year, that means that next year we'll have even more caterpillars. So something to think about. All right. And uh, we'll go over to uh, another story uh, uh, once again, uh, the death of local news and why it matters. And this is such an important story. And uh, for people that that hear this and say, yeah, you're right, it's, read the story because the, the, the figures are absolutely astounding when it comes to newspapers. Uh, and the number of counties that don't have local newspapers and the number of counties that only have a, 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 a weekly newspaper. Same thing with radio. There used to be 5,672 independent radio stations in this country. Out of those 5,000 uh, radio stations now, there's really only about 1,000 independent ones left throughout the country. Uh, and Even in our little towns. Uh, that, you know, and it's... And, you know, where are people going to get their news from? I mean, uh, it's, it really is a problem that is, that is, that is, that is more than just uh, important. Uh, it's <laughs> how will people know what's going on? Yeah, and, they're getting their news on social media, yeah. and that really is not great for no, society. No, because you don't, there's no checking. There's, there's, no, there's no editorial. There's no editorial board. There's no checking facts. I mean, right. this is how important local news is. Janet, do you want to talk a little bit? Well, so this is a talk that was um, hosted by the Scoville Library by Dan Kennedy, um, who's a media critic and writer. Um, that was a talk that was done on Zoom from Massachusetts and that we were able to pick up. But Janet, we, you know, our company, of course, has been working very hard to, to sort of stay above water and to thrive into the future. Do you want to talk about that at all? Well, I mean, we have been talking about it, uh, you know, for two years and uh, even before that. And we're in the same boat as Marshall and all these other news outlets that um, need to find new ways to survive. And so it, it's always fascinating to hear uh, people like Dan Kennedy, the professor at Northeastern, um, you know, let us know some of the nitty-gritty details of what's happening across the country once again and uh, come up with some solutions. And that's what we're trying to do, too. And so we're in the process, as we've written about, of... Uh, Apply in applying to the IRS to obtain nonprofit status so that any contributions we receive will have a tax benefit and there will be um, grants that we can uh, look at trying to apply for that we could not do as a for-profit company. Well, it's We are in the position, all of us uh, locally, uh, is uh, we have to very <laughs> think and act very quickly on our feet, uh, just simply because uh, people are so used to social media and, and the news that goes on there, and that's free. 
Uh, and and we, we would try to explain the difference to them that, that that's not news. Uh, that's that's somebody's personal opinion, what you're reading on social media. It is not news. And uh, we'll see what happens uh, as this all works out. But we're great. definitely going to work on that one. Yeah. Uh, a, a story that uh, really that what comes home to hit about this, it's, it seems rather foolish, but uh, you've got a story on the hows and whys of recent area motor vehicle thefts, which has become absolutely a, pan, a, a pandemic around here. Yeah, another pandemic. And actually, sadly, this is a story that we ran exactly at this time last year when a similar sort of um, sweep of the neighborhoods happened in Salisbury. In fact, I think my street in Lakeville was, was one of the centers of it. And so this year it was on Belgo Road, um, but also Katie Ball, or by a woman from Lakeville who, lived, who was in Milliton and had her, her car stolen. And um, this is an explanation from the police last year. I think last year it was more of a, of a newer thing. This year I feel like the police have, have commented on it less, but it seems to be a similar thing, which is, explaining how young people are coming up from the bigger cities stealing cars and then they rent out our cars to um, for, for thefts in other cities and then they just abandon the cars. But as they're going through and looking for the cars that they want to steal, they're also breaking into cars and riffling around and often not stealing stuff that you would expect them to steal. So that last year when this happened, one woman said to me, you know, I had my wallet in that car with my charge cards and they didn't take that, but they were definitely riffling around in my car. They had, like, a, a home security camera. So a reminder to everybody, even though my car is in the house, you know, garaged, I'm locking it and keeping the keys upstairs, whereas in the past I might normally have just left my car keys in, in my locked garage. But just don't, uh, don't take anything for granted. Lock up. All right, a couple of good news stories about what's uh, what's happening this weekend. First of all, good news that our good friend uh, Michael Whitney Brown is going to have a concert at Noble Horizons. He's recovered from his stroke. And also, the Falls Village Car Show is back uh, this weekend. That's right. This is a huge big deal. And um, the, car sh- the car show people had asked us to do something special just mentioning the car show this weekend, but that's not all. The car show is on Sunday. On Saturday, the whole town of Falls Village is opening up for a big artisan and craft fair. I'm sure that you've had people on the show talking about it, so I won't go into great detail, but, you know, there's everything. There's tag sale, there's big sale, there's just fun and people out, and what a delight to actually be out and just wander around and have a good time. Be very aware that parking is going to be extremely difficult. You can't really get into the village, and you need to follow the signs and park and shuttle in. And and they do have if 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 you're at any way can't walk, they do have uh, golf carts that will shuttle you back and forth to your car, so you don't have to worry about. Because once you get into Falls Village Center, it's a very easy walk, uh, it really is. But it, it you might need help getting from your car into Falls Village Center, and they have plenty of shuttles there for you to do. Um, no shortage of ideas for affordable housing plans. Ideas are, are, are inexpensive. Getting these plans into action or something else. Right. And as we've seen, as different towns in, in our coverage area are working on affordable housing plans, it's not like you can just say, like, hey, let's, you know, we got a barn. Let's do something with it. <clears throat> you know, you have to be very diplomatic and good at dealing with different interest groups within your community and making everybody feel safe that the project that's coming through will be carefully monitored. But, you know, it is nice that people are thinking about it, and Cornwall has the reputation in the area of being one of the more progressive towns. They do that wonderful um, affordable residence for seniors in such a smart place, right walking distance to the little coffee shop, and, um, you know, good parking, very comfortable accommodations. Who wouldn't want to live there? So we'll hope that all of our towns are able to move forward with some of these plans. All right. You've got a story about the uh, changing of the guard over at Salisbury Town Hall. I hate to be so ancient, but I remember. <laughs> I know. I still remember when Sue Spring was the town clerk in Salisbury, and she was wonderful. And then Patty came in, and Patty Williams came in, and and then the the burden on town clerks has gotten so immense um, that almost, I think almost every town now has an assistant town clerk, at least part time. And um, Rachel Lamb, who's a Mount Raga resident, resident, you know, grew, grew up here, really knows the town, really lovely, wonderful person. Funny, the two of them, she and Patty, are such a hilarious duo when you're in town hall. It makes it fun to go visit them. But Rachel is retiring. I think she does, it's possible she's doing some gardening, I'm not sure. But um, she's saying that she'll be traveling with her husband. Um, and there's a new sunny person in the office. His name is Christine Simmons. Um, seems quite a bit younger, which is great because it's very hard to learn to be a town clerk. And um, Salisbury is essentially training up the person for when Patty eventually wants to retire. All right. A uh, nice story on uh, the murals that have uh, arisen uh, in Sharon. 
Yeah, and the way that, that Falls Village is having its big party weekend this weekend. Last weekend was Sharon's party weekend, and um, Theo Colomb, so often at the heart of big parties in Sharon, he's a guy who knows how to bring people together for fun happenings, and so he had an art opening at Standard Space, packed a ton of people into his little gallery on Main Street, and then I, they, I know they planned something on the green. I guess you would know better if the rain allowed them to do it, or they might have gone indoors. And then the next day, four um, murals on public spaces that were unveiled by Hendricks Churchill, um, Theo was also involved in that, and um, Hendrix Churchill has done so much to beef up, beautify, um, bring up to the 21st century the commercial buildings in the center of Sharon over by uh, West Main Street, and so continuing on with that by having murals painted and then a big party to celebrate. All right. I uh, want to move on to a story uh, by uh, Lila Hawkins. First of all, Cornwall gets serious about attracting visitors and supporting locals. I think most of our towns have an economic development committee, but few of them are as active as Cornwall's, which is run by a woman who's really a genius of marketing, whose name is Janet Carlson, and she has a marketing firm in the middle of West Cornwall and has done a lot to sort of, again, take some of those empty commercial spaces and make them useful to everybody in town. They've got that little farm stand called The Local that is just so gorgeous, designed by Dee Salomon, and a lot of um, beautiful products from uh, Sam Waterston's uh, farm and beautiful soups and Susan Sicardi's baked goods. Um, so they're talking a lot about, and as they have been, different ways to attract families to town. Definitely some new families came in during the pandemic, but, you know, looking for ways to get people involved and to attract tourism to a town with two really good farmer's markets. Nice story about uh, Chuck Lewis uh, out of Falls Village. He has a new book, and the book is, uh, it's a new book, but it's about uh, uh, a, a long, long, long time ago military uh, brigade. So many people around here are amateur historians, and one of the, the dreams of life in the Northwest Corner is that you're able to retire and have a little time on your hand to do some research into something that fascinates you, and many of the people that do that here figure out a way to publish their own books on it. And again, you know, one of the, the beauties of the 21st century is there's a lot of different avenues for self-publishing. So uh, Chuck Lewis has been studying the Rhode Island Brigade um, because they're interesting, but also because his family has a nice connection to it. So we'll look forward to reading about that when he's finished with it. And then uh, along similar lines, Eric Fadden, um, who just been who bought a camera years ago and just started making little documentary films about people in Falls Village, the sm- one of the smallest towns in the state, and just an endless amount of interesting stories. Chuck Lewis, in the previous story, also a Falls Village resident. And Eric has gotten so good at making these little documentaries. They're just a delight to watch. And if you have any concerns about losing the old way of life here in the northwest corner as we have this rapid, um, intense influx of people who aren't from here, it's good to watch Eric's movies and you get a real sense of what the roots are that hold our communities together. And he's put, I think he's up to, I think about 24 or 25 of those movies now. Uh, it, so there's, and, and they're all available that you can see. It really is, it's, it's a nice way for people, especially that are moving into the area that might move into Falls Village, get a little background of the town that they've moved into. Yeah. I, I love the story on the sheepdog trial. <laughs> Me too. And I always want to say, you know, the sheepdog trial, it's like Babe the Pig. But, of course, it's the opposite. <laughs> Babe the Pig was about, you know, really about the sheepdog trials. But it was funny because there was a pig instead yeah. of a, a sheepdog. But over in uh, at the Millerton um, Sharon border, there's a wonderful farm called K.R. Farm, um, very heavily supported by the Dutchess Land Conservancy. And every year they do a sheepdog trial, and it is unbelievably fun. If um, This year wasn't really open to the public, again, because we're not quite sure on um, covid but uh, next year, we hope, knock wood, that it will be open. And you see these um, people out there, men and women, who are um, experts at using whistles and claps and hand signs to get these very hardworking dogs to uh, bring these smarter-than-you-expect sheep to order and move them from one place to another. It's really extraordinary to watch. And a nice uh, big story, Tangled Lines by Patrick Sullivan. Uh, and I love the picture of the big mouth bass. <laughs> I know. It's a big story about big mouth, big fish mouths. And, you know, I looked at it and I was like, oh, it's pretty little. But when you read his, his column, you realize, like, oh, he says, you know, and Patrick's got a big, a big paw. He said, you know, I could stick my hand in that fish's mouth and move it around and not touch any flesh. So that is a very big uh, fish mouth. But, again, a funny story from Patrick on fishing. And uh, you've got a nice uh, story also, remembering the 4th of July uh, from 1985 and on. The holidays always um, shift our schedule 
by a day. And so we put together much of this issue Friday before the July 4th weekend, and we didn't actually know if there would be a 4th of July celebration with fireworks. We knew that the normal celebrations in our area towns were not being held. The traditional um, Salisbury Band and the reading of the Declaration of Independence at the Grove had been canceled, although they did hold the Around the Lakes run uh, on July 4th um, at 8 a.m. And if you look for Sporting a Cause, Willie Hallahan's website, you can see some pictures of that. A stealth race, kind of we call it, but some nice photos because we've been so lucky to have our volunteers scanning some of our thousands and thousands of negatives, and it's been incredibly value to, valuable to us. And if anybody has any interest and uh, skill at um, scanning negatives, we would love to work with you to continue to scan. All right. Uh, we've got about six minutes left. Uh, no, pardon me, about, about three minutes left. Right. Let's go to the editorial page. Welcome to Summer Interns. Great. This is one of our uh, themes this week, uh, uh, appreciating young people. And this is what we do in the summer is um, really glad to have uh, enthusiastic Students come in who are interested in learning about journalism, and we have a couple who are on the front page last week. We, you know, last summer was really problematic because of COVID as far as the program went, and yet still we had some people who came in, uh, one of our young interns who came back this summer. So pleased to have them here. Give that a read. We also have a couple of letters, one from Peter Demi on uh, Joanne Watusiak's letter about uh, thinking about how Cornwall should handle zoning, and don't miss the columns, especially one by Catherine Overton. She wrote a letter to her great-great-great-great-grandfather, Timothy Cesar, uh, to talk about his life and what she did to honor it. And don't miss Peter Steiner's cartoon, that's all I'll say. <laughs> and it just is, yeah, it's perfect on this page. It's, it's it's, usual. It's amazing. All right, I guess we can go to Compass now for you. Uh, let's, let's go there. So Music Mountain, as um, if, as you knew, if you had con uh, tickets already for the Juilliard Quartet on July 11th, um, that concert was canceled, replaced with something else, but they're promising it will be outstanding. Um, Moby Dick, in the same way that people sometimes do readathons of James Joyce's Ulysses, there is a Moby Dick readathon. Um, Herman Melville, of course, from Massachusetts, from nearby. Um, train enthusiasts all over the place around here maybe don't know about the Danbury Railway Museum, so that opened up on July 4th weekend. And also the Antique Machinery Show, I believe, is having their show in Kent on July 24th, which is not when they normally have it. We'll have something in next week's Compass on it. Crescendo is back with a concert on July 23rd up in Great Barrington. A very funny column, um, interesting as always, from Ed Furman about streaming comedy shows and great uh, recommendations are Annabelle Baum, one of our summer interns, writing about the Norman Rockwell Museum. We think of Norman Rockwell as really being almost a documentarian of American life, but he also had a very strong fantasy component to his illustrations and then Baroque concerts online from the Northwest Music Association. And in the last moment, I just want to mention uh, in the Millerton News, a sad story, the Millerton Lions Club after 72 years has disbanded, and that is that is something that's happening to uh, service organizations and uh, ambulance and fire squads ar around our area. It's, a, it's an important story that we have to follow closely. Yeah, it's so important. Um, so, yeah, long story on it and the editorial as well. Many thanks to the Millerton Lions for all they've done over all those decades and their commitment to the community. They've made a big difference. All right, we'll, sp we'll speak to you next week. Have a great week, guys. You too. You too, thank you. Thank that you. is uh, This Week in the Lakeville Journal. You can find the Lakeville Journal, of course, at your newsstand. You get home delivery or online at tricornernews.com.